All right, hello everyone. Um, hope you've had a chance to look over the feedback on your test. And uh, don't forget, you can submit corrections to any of your tests all the way through the end of the semester, or all the way, excuse me, all the way through the final exam. Um, the final exam won't have uh, any associated corrections with it. All right, so let's jump into the first part of our last unit. Um, carbohydrate pathways that are related to glycolysis. So today we have six learning objectives. Um, first, we're gonna describe the structure and function of glycogen, which you guys already know some about. Um, and we're also going to walk through both glycogen synthesis and the breakdown of glycogen called glycogenolysis. We're going to compare and contrast three uh, small peptide hormones, insulin, glucagon and epinephrine. We're also gonna identify conditions when gluconeogenesis occurs. And finally, we'll do a quick review of the pentose phosphate shunt. Okay, so there are several pathways that are connected to glycolysis. And uh, of course, some of them you already know. Um, the Krebs cycle, I guess you could say, is connected to glycolysis um, on the tail end through pyruvate and uh, acetyl-CoA. Um, but today we're going to talk about pathways that are actually uh, that touch glycolysis that use substrates that could go on to uh, per to uh, perform glycolysis um, of course one of them we already know is the pentose phosphate shunt um, but today we're going to focus on glycogen synthesis and breakdown and also making new glucose gluconeogenesis so really overall this whole lecture could be called what your body does when it has a huge surplus or not enough glucose. Okay, so here's a, path, here's a pathway map showing pathways that we already know and new ones that we're gonna talk about today. So here we have what we already know, starting with glucose and all the way down to pyruvate is good old fashioned glycolysis. Um, we also have this little side pathway from pyruvate to lactate shown on the bottom left. Um, in the middle, um, surrounded by the red square, we have the pentose phosphate shunt. And we already spoke about how this generates NADPH as sort of a side pathway uh, related to glycolysis. So first we're gonna talk about glycogen synthesis and breakdown. Um, that's here on the right-hand side of our map. Glucose 6-phosphate is converted to glucose 1-phosphate which then becomes UDP glucose, and that can be turned into glycogen. So let's talk about that. So the first thing we need to talk about is the structure and function of glycogen. And the first thing that jumps out when you look at glycogen, glycogen is very large. In fact, it's so large, you can actually see it under a microscope. So in this uh, microscope image, the letter G is pointing to specks of glycogen. So uh, you know that old saying about how the Great Wall of China is the only thing that can be seen from space? That's actually kind of a myth, um, or the only structure that can be seen from space. But it doesn't matter, because that's a myth. Glycogen is like that, but in real life, not a myth. Glycogen molecules are so large, you can see them as tiny little specks within liver cells, for example. Okay, so glyco glycogen is really large. Um, let's talk about what makes it so large. So it's got lots and lots of chains of glucose molecules attached one to another. The straight chain portions are alpha 1, 4 link linkages. So those are these straight lines you can see coming out of the center here. And every time a branch occurs, that's a 1, 6 linkage. And at the middle, there's a tiny protein called glycogenin. So this is, it just forms the core of glycogen. So mostly glucose molecules. And breaking down glycogen supplies a steady stream of glucose that your body needs for energy. And it begins by splitting the alpha-1-4 straight chain links. But once it gets to an alpha-1-6 bond, one of those branch links, it can also break those down. And each time it breaks one of these bonds, it releases a whole molecule of glucose uh, for your body to uh, metabolize. So yeah, glycogen's main purpose is as a glucose buffer. In the liver, 
It provides energy to the body during times of fasting and stress when you don't have a ready supply of glucose. And in the muscle, it does the same thing, but it doesn't provide energy to the whole body. It's just for that muscle tissue only. It's also found in other tissues in small amounts. Okay, so how is it synthesized? I touched on this for a second when we were looking at the pathway map. So glucose 6-phosphate, shown here on the top right, is incorporated into glycogen. So this is what is the product of glycolysis step one. So as soon as you put a phosphate on that glucose, remember that helps it keep it inside the cell. Now it can be converted into glycogen. So the first step is uh, taking that glucose 1-phosphate and uh, or taking that glucose 6 phosphate and converting it to glucose 1 phosphate, switching the position of that orange ball phosphate uh, moiety. So, this is done by an enzyme called phosphoglucomutase, and it's a near equilibrium reaction. The next step is the formation of uridine diphosphate glucose. So, uh, uridine triphosphate. Um, so, I guess I should clear this up. You know how ATP is a nucleotide attached to three inorganic phosphates? Um, UTP also is, but it's uridine instead of adenine. So um, UTP comes in and displaces that phosphate group to make UDP glucose, uridine diphosphate glucose. And the third and final step um, or the third and final step is catalyzed by glycogen synthase, and this is the rate limiting step. Um, so this is also the most important step in actually forming glycogen. So let's dig a little bit deeper into that step. And you can find both of these pictures on your handout. So the glycogen synthase overall reaction is the displacement of the UDP portion, the uridine diphosphate portion, um, to produce a glucose carbocation. So this is shown below. The uridine diphosphate uh, leaves, and when it leaves, it creates what's shown here in the middle, this uh, glucose carbocation, so shown right here. And you can notice that little uh, cation right there. So you know carbon doesn't like that, so carbocations are really reactive. Um, you probably learned about these back in organic chemistry. And what happens is that carbocation is attacked by the four hydroxy group of the non-reducing end of glycogen. So that's going to be right here. Oops. So as we know, glucose has hydroxy groups at nearly every position. So how come the carbocation only attacks the four prime hydroxy during glycogen synthesis? Why doesn't it attack a different one? Why not the six prime? Why not the, uh, well, why not the two prime? So if you look on your handout, you'll find a little box. Take 60 seconds to think and write out your ideas. I know since you're at home, you don't really have a neighbor you can uh, talk to about it, but we'll talk to you about it once you're done. So pause the playback and write out your ideas why it only attacks the four prime hydroxy. Okay, so remember, the enzyme conformation physically limits other reactions. So the shape of the enzyme that facilitates re this reaction only allows the four prime to face the carbocation. So if the carbocation can't get around to the other positions, it'll only react with what's in front of it. Remember, when it comes to enzymes, shape is key. Okay, so we talked about how to extend a chain of glucose in a glycogen by that carbocation attacking at the four prime position. How do we make these branches that are at the six position? So we have uh, glycogen branching enzymes. So the branching step only works on branches that already have at least 11 glucose residues. So noted here in, oops, noted here in uh, green. Glycogen branching enzyme removes at least six of the glycosal units, glucosal units from the reducing end to an interior 6-hydroxyl position. So it basically just picks these up 
and scooches them downwards, connects them to a lower point on the chain. Well, by doing this, you can see now we've got two ends of this branch, or two ends on this uh, chain. So we've created a branch point. So when you have an alpha 1,6 bond in glycogen, that's called the branch point. So let's talk about glycogen in, which is the protein core of glycogen. So this is required for de novo synthesis of glycogen. So what I mean by that is making glycogen from, uh, if you don't have any glycogen, how do you start making glycogen? Well, you start with the protein core. And this protein core, glycogen in, serves both as an enzyme and as a scaffold. And I'll talk about that. So first alone, it acts as a primer. So it polymerizes the first few glucose molecules onto itself. So if there's no glycogen, glycogen can be used to make brand new glycogen. Um, after the first few glucose molecules have attached to it, other enzymes take over. So it only works for the first few glucose molecules, but that's all it needs to do. So it's a homodimer and it's a glycosyl transferase. Um, if you look closely, you should be able to see the symmetry within glycogen. And I guess I'd probably put the plane right about here. So once you've got, once glycogen in has started attaching glucoses to itself, further buildup of glycogen involves those other enzymes that we talked about previously. Glycogen synthase for making those straight chains and branching enzymes for making new branches. So in your body, most glycogen synthesis involves adding to, additional, adding to existing glycogen and not actually de novo synthesis. It's very rare that you actually eat up all the glycogen uh, in your liver. Um, so for reference, you build up glycogen from the inside out. Similarly, as we'll talk about in a minute, you break down glycogen from the outside in. So in order to completely, I guess, eat up a glycogen molecule, you have to eat up the entire thing from the outside in. So that typically only happens under severe stress or starvation or uh, things like that. Typically you're just adding on to existing glycogen. But if you do need new glycogen, um, don't worry, glycogen in can uh, help you out there. So now that we've talked about what is glycogen, its structure and its function, let's also talk about insulin. So insulin is a peptide hormone which is involved in anabolic regulation. So regulation of biosynthesis, making larger molecules from smaller ones. Um, it's only 51 amino acids, so it's, it's not very large. It's, yeah, it's actually really small compared to most proteins. And like I mentioned, it's an anabolic hormone. So this means it favors conversion of small molecules, such as glucose, into large ones like glycogen. Insulin has a lot of different jobs within the body. The main most famous one is uh, regulating your blood sugar, but there are also a lot of other uh, jobs that it does. So what we're talking about here is not the only thing that insulin does, but it's what we care about for today if we're talking about uh, glycolysis and glycogen and gluconeogenesis. So don't forget that. Glyco or insulin does a lot of different things. But just for today, we're going to talk about its blood sugar uh, regulation activities. So in your body, if you eat something, that rise in blood sugar that's resultant from you consuming glucose triggers the release of insulin. And what insulin does is it leads to increased glycogen synthesis. So I think an easy way to like sort of talk out what's going on here is by your body says, oh, I just ate something delicious. Now I've got a lot of glucose, but I don't need it all right now. I'm just sitting here digesting. I'm not really using it for anything. Let's save it for later. Maybe I'll need it later. So it makes a bunch of insulin and that insulin causes glucose to be saved for later in the form of glycogen. Let's talk about how. So glycogen synthase 3, which in this figure is referred to as GSK, 
typically inactivates glycogen synthase. So glycogen synthase makes glycogen from glucose. So if GSK is active, then glycogen synthase will not be active. GSK will prevent glycogen synthase from doing its job. It will prevent new glycogen from being, or prevent glycogen from being added onto. Oops. But when insulin comes in, and insulin binds to the outside of the cell on the insulin receptor, that causes a long cascade of signals. And those signals inactivate GSK. They end up by, actually they phosphorylate GSK. So you put a phosphoryl group onto GSK, that makes it inactive. So as we just talked about, GSK prevents glyc glycogen synthase from doing its job. So if you get rid of GSK, if you prevent GSK from doing its job, then glycogen synthase is going to be good to go and it can make a bunch of glycogen. So remember, if you, so think of it, uh, if you eat something, you have a lot of glucose, your body needs to store that as glycogen. Insulin shows up, it tells glycogen synthase to get out of the way, stop interfering with glycogen synthase and allow glycogen to build up. So this signaling cascade um, is pretty interesting, but it's also pretty long. And I'm not gonna test you guys over this. Um, you can read these two slides or in your book if you wish. Um, a lot of things in biology actually happen through these long convoluted signaling cascades. Once again, you don't have to know this part either, um, but if you're interested, you can read about it. Okay, so let's review. Now we know, well, first what glycogen is, and we know how to make glycogen. So if we have glucose 6-phosphate from the first step in glycolysis, that gets converted to glucose 1-phosphate and then to UDP glucose, uridine diphosphate glucose. UDP glucose adds the glucose portion alpha 1,4 onto an existing glycogen chain via the important enzyme glycogen synthase. And the core of glycogen is a small protein called glycogenin. And if you remember, glycogenin can both act as a scaffold to hold glycogen, but also it can add, it can make new glycogen by adding glucoses onto itself. Yeah. So if we eat something, if we intake a lot of glucose, then we make more insulin, which tells our body to store that glucose as glycogen. So this is a pretty good stopping point. You should see on your handout, um, there's a big bar that is a good time for you to get your notes in order, um, take a break, get a drink of water. Um, before continuing the lecture and moving on to part two. All right, welcome back. Now that we know how to make glycogen and what it's useful for, um, well, let's learn how to use it. Let's learn how to break down glycogen to release that glucose. So glycogenolysis, glycogenolysis, not completely sure, probably glycogenolysis is how you pronounce it. Um, if you think back to your Greek, Glycogen, lysis, lysis means to cut. So we're gonna be breaking down glycogen. So the removal of glucose residues from, non -reducing, from the non-reducing end of glycogen um, occurs by glycogen phosphorylase. Glycogen synthase makes glycogen. Glycogen phosphorylase breaks down glycogen. And uh, the mechanism is actually basically uh, glycogen synthase in reverse. It goes through a glucose carbocation. But it can't cleave alpha 1, 6 bonds. So for breaking down glycogen, we eat from the outside on those straight chains until we hit a branch point, and then we're stuck. Glycogen phosphorylase cannot eat through a branch point. But you know what can eat through a branch point? Debranching enzyme. At some point, biochemists figured out that uh, they're running out of words for enzymes and they just started calling them what they do, which I think is great. 
Um, so what does debranching enzyme do? It gets rid of branches. Easy. Um, so that's shown in the picture here below. So what it, ta what it does is it takes a short stub of a branch and removes the entire thing except for one glucose subunit and it takes it to a neighboring or a nearby branch. Not necessarily neighboring, but nearby. So here it takes these three subunits and uh, puts them on the nearby branch. And then it leaves one leftover glucose subunit. And that unit is removed by a different enzyme, glucosidase. And uh, what happens is that enzyme comes and hydrolyzes that glucose subunit, producing free glucose and also, as you'll notice, this entire branch has been removed. You just got a straight chain again. Great, so now we know how to break down both the straight chain portions of glycogen and the branch points of glycogen. So we can actually start using this to make free glucose within the body. So in the muscle, glycogen is used to support muscle contraction. Um, so muscle contraction and uh, the concurrent glycogenolysis occur in response to increased calcium levels. And so calcium is released from internal stores in your body in response to nerve stimulated depolarization. So this causes muscle contraction. If you tell your muscles to contract, what you're doing is releasing calcium in order to uh, stimulate those muscles to contract and therefore, you know, eat up some glycogen. However, the glycogen in your liver, as we mentioned, is a glucose buffer for your entire body. So glycogen in your muscles, just used for your muscles. Glycogen in your liver maintains the entire body. So what it does is it releases or takes up glucose from the blood in order to try to maintain a constant level. Of course, it's not gonna be, you know, 100% success, successful. Your blood sugar will vary, um, hopefully pretty gently throughout the day. Hopefully it won't spike or crater. Um, so by releasing, by performing glycogenolysis, releasing glucose, or uh, synthesizing glycogen, taking up excess glucose, it tries to maintain sort of a constant level. So the breakdown of liver glycogen releases glucose into the blood. So let's talk about glucagon, insulin's evil twin. So we talked about how insulin was the main anabolic hormone, builds up glycogen. Glucagon tells your cells to eat up glycogen, break down glycogen, form free glucose. So it's the main catabolic hormone. Yeah, so insulin, you know, favorable towards the buildup of glycogen. It's a large molecule built out of smaller molecules, anabolic. Glucagon causes the breakdown of glycogen, catabolic breaks down larger molecules into smaller molecules. Insulin aims to decrease the blood glucose level. If your blood glucose level is too high, insulin wants that to come down and wants that extra glucose to be stored. Whereas glucagon, if your blood glucose level is too low, glucagon works to increase that blood glucose level to healthy levels. And finally, I didn't mention this before, but I really want to drive home the insulin's evil twin storyline here. Insulin is produced by beta cells in the pancreas, whereas glucagon is produced by alpha cells in the pancreas. So you really have, uh, <laughs> I mean, I guess they're, they're good neighbors, but they work to opposite ends. So how does this work? So when glucose levels drop, the pancreatic alpha cells release glucagon into the blood. And uh, this sort of floats around in your bloodstream until it hits a glucagon receptor on your liver cells. So the target for glucagon is liver cells. And uh, when it hits its target, this leads to the glucagon signaling pathway, similar to how insulin leads to the insulin signaling pathway. And I've shown that pathway here on the right. Um, this is something we're not going to spend a lot of time on because similar to the insulin pathway, there is a lot to unpack here. Just know that it leads to the breakdown of glycogen and the release of that glucose into the blood from the liver after several steps. If you want to dig into this, this is in your book. 
um, it's pretty interesting. But you know, it won't be on your test. You just need to know that the end goal is releasing glucose into the blood. So how about epinephrine? So this one is sort of the uh, the I guess the the third triplet. I guess that doesn't seem quite right because the other two I already said the evil twin. So the benign triplet, I suppose. Epinephrine is also known as adrenaline. So you've probably heard of this one. It's produced in adrenal glands near your kidneys, and it acts similar to glucagon, but mainly for muscle tissue. So what it does is it releases extra glucose from the glucagon in your muscle tissue when you're exerting yourself, when you're doing exercise, or when you're stressed. So how I like to remember it is if you're an adrenaline junkie, you, you seek out exciting experiences. You move your body, you go exercise, you go hiking or mountain biking or something, and that takes a lot of energy. Seeking out exciting things takes energy. Well, if your muscles need energy, adrenaline leads to glycogen breakdown in your muscle, releasing free glucose so your muscle can eat that up. So adrenaline junkies need to break down glycogen in their muscles. So here in the United States, we call it epinephrine. Um, I think the British actually use adrenaline, but they're the same thing. Epinephrine is adrenaline. Okay, so let's play a little game. Um, let's play higher or lower. So you can find this box on your handout. Um, and during each of the scenarios listed on the left, think about whether this would cause insulin to be increased or decreased. Same for glucagon, same for epinephrine. So the answers are uh, whether this will make it higher, make it lower, or not really affect it. So take about 60 seconds, think through it, and I'll meet you on the next slide. All right, welcome to the next slide. So, if you eat a big dinner, what'll happen? So, if you eat a big dinner, you have a lot of blood glucose and you need to store that for later. So, insulin is going to be upregulated. Insulin is going to be increased. And whereas its evil twin, glucagon, is going to be decreased. Glucagon tells us we need to use glucose now. Insulin says we need to save this glucose for later. We have a lot of glucose, so let's save some for later. We're not really exerting ourselves, so epinephrine is not really changed. Okay, so the next morning we wake up, it's late. Uh, we skip breakfast, so we're pretty hungry. So insulin is down, we don't have a lot of extra blood sugar. Insulin is lower. Whereas glucagon is saying, oh hey, that glucose that we stored earlier, now's the time to use it. We're hungry, we don't have time to eat, let's eat that glucagon. So actually, if you take a microscope image of your liver cells right when you wake up in the morning, that's probably when your glycogen is the smallest. Glucagon has been maintaining your blood sugar all the way up till breakfast time, and it's been eating on those glycogen stores to maintain that level. So we're late, so you ride your bike to class. So mainly epinephrine is what's, gonna, what's going to be higher here. Higher epinephrine means your muscles are working hard. They need their local glycogen stores to be drawn upon so that they can use that glucose for energy. Um, glucagon also is likely slightly higher. This one's a little bit iffy. I made sure to check some other people on this and we think it checks out. Um, but if you can find a lot of papers that say glucagon increases during physical exertion. Probably that's just because you have lower blood sugar because you're using energy. It's probably nothing more complicated than that. But the main thing to remember is if you're exerting yourself, epinephrine, ep epinephrine is what's doing the work. All right, let's move on. So one more thing that's important for the regulation of glycogen storage and usage are a, a family of enzymes called AMP kinases. So these are dependent on AMP, you know, ATP, ADP, AMP, and they act sort of like as sensors of energy status. So if your ATP consumption is really high, you'll make a lot of AMP. 
because you know ATP goes to ADP which goes to AMP so when your ATP consumption exceeds the production of ATP these sensors go off so AMPK phosphorylates and inactivates glycogen synthase it stops new glycogen from being formed so if you're eating or if you're using a lot of energy AMPK will say hey don't use that glucose to make glycogen give me the glucose now because I'm using a lot of energy so it's not directly tied in with the other three but it does act sort of as a glucose sensor so your body knows when it needs ATP okay so let's do a mini review of uh, glycogenolysis so glycogen phosphorylase releases glucose from the ends of glycogen until it's four glucose units away from a branch point I actually don't know if I men mentioned that before four glucose units away from a branch point and then debranching enzymes transfer those three glucoses to a nearby branch and hydrolyze the last glucose which removes that branch so that's how we metabolize glycogen less blood glucose means more glucagon which then travels to the liver and causes more glycogen breakdown so this sort of helps to try to even out our blood glucose blood glucose levels throughout the day less muscle glucose leads to more epinephrine which travels to the muscle and leads to glycogen breakdown in the muscle alone okay so this is also another good stopping point before we jump into the last third of today's talk gluconeogenesis and pentose phosphate shunt so if you need a minute to get some water uh, pause the video and uh, go grab some all right for the rest of us and I assume that the first group is also back by now let's jump into gluconeogenesis shown with the arrow here in the circle number three So gluconeogenesis can actually happen in a lot of different ways in your body, but we're going to focus on the pathway from lactate to glucose. So just to explain, gluconeogenesis is making new glucose from what we've already got in the body. You can get glucose by eating it, I suppose, but you can also make it in your body from other things like lactate. It, bas it basically works as glycolysis in reverse. But as you know, there's a few metabolically irreversible steps in glycolysis. So if it's irreversible, well, we can't use that in reverse. So those three steps are hexokinase, phosphofructokinase, and pyruvate kinase. So there are ways to get around these in your body. We're not going to go through this pathway step by step either, because there's a, a lot of pathways today. We just want to really know when gluconeogenesis is necessary, when it happens. If you really do want to dive into it, it's in your book, and there's also good write-ups on the internet as well. Um, it's important to know that although lactate to glucose is essentially glycolysis in reverse, there are other ways to make new glucose in your body as well. There are other starting points. For example, a glycerol which is, uh, remember, triglycerides, you can make new glucose from that. So when does gluconeogenesis occur? So let's talk about uh, feeding and fasting. So uh, similar to what we talked about with glycogen, um, those sort of same sort of dynamics act on gluconeogenesis. So you know during a meal, glucose moves from the digest di digestive tract to the bloodstream and this triggers insulin release. So we're going to store that glucose as a glycogen in your liver. Well, if you're storing that if you're storing that glucose as glycogen, you don't want to make new glucose. You'll be wasting your time. Your body by triggering an insulin release is saying, "I've got too much glucose right now." So, if your body is saying it doesn't need more glucose, it's not going to make more glucose. So, the uh, liver gluconeogenesis is suppressed. Most gluconeogenesis occurs within the liver. So if you've got a lot of extra glucose, gluconeogenesis is suppressed. 
insulin suppresses gluconeogenesis. And as we already mentioned, this also suppresses uh, glycogenolysis, the breakdown of glycogen in the liver and the muscle, and it stimulates glucotransport, glucose transport into the muscle. So if you've got a bunch of glucose, insulin does whatever it can to prevent new glucose from being made. What about later on? What about after a meal? So your blood glucose is going to drop um, if you're not eating, and uh, gluconeogenesis will increase in the liver. If we don't have enough blood glucose, well, let's make some new stuff. Gluconeogenesis helps us make new stuff. So let's go ahead and do that. And concurrently with this, at the same time, we're gonna break down glycogen, which as we know is mediated by glucagon and epinephrine. So breaking down glycogen releases glucose into the bloodstream. The other option is to make brand new glucose via gluconeogenesis. Once again, if you're really interested in how we make new glucose, you can find that in your book. But these are basically our two options for maintaining stable blood sugar throughout the day breakdown of glycogen and gluconeogenesis. And the same sort of uh, dynamics are at play in both of these. How about when you're exercising? We already know that epinephrine sort of governs glucose consumption during exercise. So when you exercise, glucose consumption increases greatly. You're doing a lot of work. You need to consume that energy. But we also know that when uh, you're working hard, uh, pyruvate gets converted to lactate. Um, remember, the goal of that was to regenerate NAD+. And typically, most lactate gets converted back to pyruvate. Um, it's not super important, the exact proportions, but you might remember that that was a reversible reaction. It's near equilibrium. So pyruvate to lactate, lactate can easily go back to pyruvate. But there's going to be some left over when you exercise. During exercise, blood flow is shunted away from your liver. Um, but when you're done, blood flow returns. And uh, as you know, your liver has, uh, is highly perfused. There's a lot of blood flowing through your liver. I love your liver. liver is, your liver is probably the most important organ of your body, in my opinion. Fun fact, I think like the ancient English thought that the liver was like where your personality was. It was where your brain was, basically. Um, that's not true. Your brain is where your brain is, but your liver is still really important. Anyway, your liver. So when exercise ends, blood flow returns. And if there's any leftover lactate from when you were working out, some of that's going to make it to your liver where it's converted to glucose by gluconeogenesis. So that's why I wanted to touch on lactate to glucose. When you work out, some of that lactate ends up being converted back into brand new glucose in your liver. And as I mentioned, lactate to glucose is sort of the reverse of glycolysis with a couple extra steps in there. Whereas uh, other ways to get new glucose don't necessarily go through the exact same path. So that's when gluconeogenesis occurs. Um, when you need more glucose in your bloodstream, so when you're hungry, or the leftovers of lactate from after you've exercised. Finally, let's do a quick review of the pentose phosphate shunt. We actually already know most of what we need to know about the pentose phosphate shunt for this class. So we, we know that the pentose phosphate shunt has two major contributions for the cell. It generates NADPH, which is a useful for anabolic processes. And it also generates ribose 5-phosphate, and ribose 5-phosphate is used for the synthesis of nucleotides, um, which we'll actually talk about in a couple chapters, I think. Um, so this begins with glucose 6-phosphate, and this path pathway is most crucial, for, most crucial for red blood cells, as we mentioned earlier, because they lack a mitochondria, and therefore they lack any other ways to get NADPH. Um, but just because other cells have other ways to perform anabolism, doesn't mean they don't have the pentose phosphate shunt. It's present in other cells as well, but it's not as important, it's not as crucial as it is for red blood cells. Okay, so this is sort of a uh, 
a fun-filled chapter. It's packed with a lot of content. And I've tried to break it down so that you come away with the most important takeaways. We don't have to walk through each and every step of these pathways like, you did, like we did with the Krebs cycle or glycolysis, but I do want you guys to know why they're in your body, when they're used in your body, and how they affect each other. So let's review what we've learned. First, glycogen is mainly a highly branched polysaccharide containing glucose, and the straight chains are gonna be bonded alpha 1,4, and the branches are bonded alpha 1,6. Um, I said mainly because there's the glycogen in at its center, at the uh, protein core of glycogen. And glycogen in the liver acts as a reservoir for maintaining blood sugar throughout your body. Whereas in the muscles, it acts only as a local reservoir. It only works to maintain energy stores for the muscles that it's in. Next, glycogen synthesis starts with glucose 6-phosphate. Remember, step one in glycolysis, it can branch off right there at step one. And the pathway to synthesize glycogen um, contains a, a step with a carbocation as part of its mechanism. So the glycogen synthase portion requires a carbocation. And the creation of branch points, so the alpha-1-6 parts, require transferring six glucose units to an interior glucose. Next, glycogen breakdown releases glucose, and this also requires debranching enzyme at the branch points. So making glycogen requires several different enzymes, so does breaking it down. Objective four, this one is probably the most important one in my opinion. So insulin signals your body to store excess glucose in various different ways. Glucagon signals your body to release stored glucose in different ways. And epinephrine tells your muscles to break down glycogen during times of exercise. So insulin and glucagon are basically exact opposites. Glucagon and epinephrine are sort of, they're sort of similar, but epinephrine mainly acts for your muscles. Okay, gluconeogenesis moves sort of in tandem with glycogenolysis to maintain glucose levels. Glycogenolysis chews up glycogen to release gl uh, glucose into the bloodstream. Gluconeogenesis makes brand new glucose to release into the bloodstream. And one major source of this is going to be lactate post-exercise. And finally, the pentose phosphate shunt generates two important things for cells. NADPH for anabolism and ribose 5-phosphate for making uh, nucleic acids. And this is particularly important in red blood cells. Okay, um, if you have any questions, please let me know. We're approaching the end of the semester here, and I think this is actually our third to last lecture. So if you have any burning questions, don't let them wait. Uh, write them down, email me, do whatever it takes to get those answers. And uh, have a great week, and uh, yeah, take it easy.